is up everybody my name is paper popper player and today we are going to be unboxing mono green tron for popper now some of you people who know the popper meta pretty well are going to be in the comments like um mono green tron um actually the best kind of tron at the moment is flicker tron and ultra tron and i just feel uh, hey you guess what i don't give a f <laughs> mono green tron has always been still is and always will be one of my favorite decks in modern and so I really wanted to play it in Popper. Now it is true, the best versions of Tron and Popper at the moment are Flicker Tron and Ultra Tron combo, but Mono Green and Tron is still completely viable. So if you're interested in the deck, the list will be linked down in the description below. And while you're down there, press subscribe button. And next couple weeks, I'll be opening up Boggles and then we're gonna be doing some non-unboxing videos that I'm pretty excited about. As per usual, we'll be sleeving our deck in our Dragon Shield Mat sleeves and keeping our deck in our Ultimate Guard Boulder deck box. Oh, I want for Christmas is packing peanuts. Let's go. Oh man, Card Kingdom sent out an email that they were having like delayed shipping problems. I ordered this deck like three weeks ago, um, so I'm glad it finally came in. Oh, and also somebody in my previous video brought to my attention that apparently Card Kingdom folds their tape. So you have like easy flaps to just be able to pull this off and i didn't know that but hopefully to trigger that person i'm just gonna keep cutting these open anyways oh look they gave me two of the exact same tokens it's Somebody fiona from Shrek. so there's a possibility that some of you might be asking what is tron that movie is kind of mid how does that relate to magic well we can't talk about tron unless we talk about the urza lands the tron lands are three lands that were originally printed in antiquities and their names are urza's power plant urza's mine and urza's tower all of these lands produce one colorless mana unless you happen to have all three of them on the field at the same time. The second you play the third and final land, all of them tap for additional mana. If you control all three lands, Urza's Power Plant and Urza's Mine will produce two colorless mana, and Urza's Tower will produce three colorless mana. This means if you're able to play all three lands by the time your third turn comes around, you're gonna have seven mana on turn three. And this isn't like a group thing. Once you have the three initial lands on the field, any additional Tron lands that you play will also be able to tap for the additional mana that it produces. So as you may be able to guess, this this deck is playing four copies of each Urza's land, and the deck's goal is to just drop huge creatures and cast huge spells by turn three. The rest of the lands in the deck aren't too crazy though. We have two copies of Crystal Grotto, which enters the battlefield tapped and you get to scry one. It taps for a colorless mana, and then you can pay one mana and tap it to add one mana of any color. Scrying allows you to look at the top card of your library, and then if you don't like that card, you could pitch it to the bottom of your library. And that's really important in this deck because we have a million draw spells because we're just trying to get to Tron as quickly as possible. Now, this deck isn't completely colorless. It is called a mono green Tron for a reason, so we are running five basic forest. So let's go ahead and talk about our payoff cards, the cards that we'll be able to play once we get all three of our Tron lands onto the field starting off with our main win condition maelstrom colossus maelstrom colossus is an eight mana seven seven creature with cascade cascade is an extremely busted mechanic and honestly it shouldn't exist and cascade's a little hard to explain so we're just gonna read the card because reading the card explains the card when you cast this spell exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less you may cast it without paying its mana cost put the exile cards on the bottom of your library in any random order. So first things first, Cascade triggers when you cast the spell. So even if your opponent wants to counter the Maelstrom Colossus, the Cascade trigger will resolve even if Maelstrom Colossus doesn't. With that being said, the card that you Cascade into can also get countered because you also have to cast that. So let's say the Cascade goes off and you Cascade into a Boulder Branch Golem, which when it enters the battlefield, you gain life equal to its power and its power is six. If your opponent doesn't want you to gain that life because you still are casting this card, your opponent can counterspell the Boulder Branch Golem. The Boulder Branch Golem will get countered and then you just have the Maelstrom Colossus. Now, on the other hand, let's say you cascade into something like Chromatic Sphere. Your opponent does not give a f if you have a Chromatic Sphere because you've probably already played this card at the beginning of the game and it doesn't really do anything at this point. So they can now counter your Maelstrom Colossus Counterspell will resolve, Chromatic Sphere will resolve and land on the field, and the Maelstrom will get countered. The final thing about Cascade is that it's non-land cards that cost less than Maelstrom Colossus. So if you go to Cascade and the first card you flip over is a Maelstrom Colossus, 
You can't cast this because it costs the same amount as your other Maelstrom Colossus, obviously. And so because eight is not less than eight, you have to now exile your next card. It's a forest. It says non-land card, so you can't cascade that. Flip this over one more time. It's your Chromatic Sphere. Feels kind of bad, but your Chromatic Sphere will then go onto the field, and then you have your Maelstrom Colossus out. I hope that was a good enough explanation of Cascade. It is a bit of a tricky mechanic. But with that being said, as I mentioned, Maelstrom Colossus is one of our main win conditions, so we are running four copies of him. Next up is a new card from Brothers War, and I think this card is what makes Mono Green Tron good again. Um, and the reason why I say that is because Burn is really prominent right now. And Boulder Branch Golem is a 7 mana 6 5 creature that when it enters the battlefield, you gain life equal to its power. So if you do have turn 3 Tron, you get to drop a 6 5 on turn 3 and gain 6 life, which is huge. What's also cool about this card is it has a new mechanic called Prototype. What Prototype means is that you can cast a spell for reduced mana costs, and the only thing that will change is its power and toughness. So Boulder Branch Golem's prototype mana cost is 4 mana, which is a green and 3 colorless, and then it'll turn it into a 3-3. And then with its ability that you gain life equal to its power when it enters the battlefield, you will only gain 3 life instead of the 6. This is an extremely strong card in this deck because when you cascade it, you cascade it for its full mana cost, so you'll gain 6 life, which is huge. So next up, we have 4 copies of Wretched Griff, which is a 7 mana 3-4 Eldrazi creature with flying and emerge. So essentially what emerge does is it reduces the casting cost of the card as long as you sacrifice a creature while casting it. In this case, Wretched Griff's emerge cost is 6 mana, a blue and 5 colorless, but that doesn't matter to us because we're playing Tron and on turn 3 we're going to have the 7 mana anyways. So we're playing this on turn 3, we don't have to sacrifice any creatures, and when you cast Wretched Griff, draw a card. The reason why I emphasize the word cast there is because it's really strong with Maelstrom Colossus. The hilarious thing about Wretched Griff is that because Cascade makes you cast the card, if your opponent wants to counterspell the Wretched Griff, you still get to draw the card from it because you're casting it from the Cascade. So now it puts your opponent in a really shitty situation because typically speaking, if Wretched Griff drew a card when it entered the battlefield, your opponent would counter this 100% of the time because drawing a card is really strong. So now they have to choose whether they want to counter the giant body that's a 7-7 Maelstrom Colossus or if they want to counter the really hard to block 3-4 flyer. God, Wretched Griff is so good in this deck. Okay, next up we have Ulamog's Crusher, which is an 8-mana 8 8-8 eight, eight Eldrazi creature with Annihilator 2 and says Ulamog's Crusher attacks each turn if able. What Annihilator 2 does is that when this creature attacks, defending player has to sacrifice two permanents. Making your opponent sacrifice two permanents is absolutely crippling. If your opponent happens to already be a little behind and running a little slow, this is absolutely a game ender because if they don't have any creatures on the field or any artifacts or any non-land permanents, they have to sacrifice their lands with this. It's absolutely disgusting and we're playing four copies of it. So next up, we have four copies of Fingered Marauder, a six mana, five colorless, and a green five five creature that says whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may gain five life. He's just a beefy five five creature, but this ability is really strong in the meta right now. Not only are we running a whopping 13 artifacts that all sacrifice themselves and go into the graveyard, but Fingered Marauder also complete fuck dude I just dropped all the cards <laughs> literally almost every single popper deck in 2022 sacrifices artifacts this card is the ultimate punisher when your opponent plays deadly dispute Ashion's altar makeshift munitions Kadoltha Rebirth, when they play their own Chromatic Stars or Chromatic Spheres, this card literally gains you 5 life for almost every single engine card in Popper. God, I love that card. Anyways, next up, we have 4 copies of Ancient Stirrings, which is a 1 green mana sorcery. Look at the top 5 cards of your library. You may reveal a colorless card from among them and put it into your hand. Then put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. So in the early game, you're using this card to dig through your deck to try to find your Tron lands as fast as possible possible because lands are colorless cards so you can pick them and in the late game you can use it to try to find a copy of any of the 16 ginormous threats that we've already gone over because all these cards are colorless creature cards so we're running four copies of ancient stirrings this is also a staple in the modern version of this deck and next up we have four copies of abundant harvest which is a one green mana sorcery choose land or non-land reveal cards from top of your library until you reveal a card of the chosen kind put that card into your hand and the rest of the 
bottom of your library in any random order. The thing that makes Ancient Strings so good is that you get to look at the top five cards and you get to choose which card it is, which is really nice because, you know, if you have multiple of the same type of card, uh, you get to pick which one's the better one. Abundant Harvest, on the other hand, allows you to filter what comes up, but if you run into something you don't really need, then it kind of sucks. If you turn one Abundant Harvest and you choose land because you're trying to find a Tron land, and as you're revealing the top cards of your library, the first one you run into is a forest, that feels kind of bad. With Ancient Strings, if you look at the top five cards of your library and there isn't a land in it, then you don't get to keep digging. You just have to pick one of the non-land cards and then put the rest in the bottom of your library. Now that's a double-edged sword. The benefit of it is that initially you weren't gonna draw any lands. You had five cards on top of your library that weren't lands. Now you get to put four of them on the bomb, one of them into your hand, and now you have a higher chance of drawing a land. Regardless, they both have their ups and downs, but at the end of the day, they're both really good cards at filtering this deck. So to wrap this deck up, we're gonna be going over the 13 artifacts that we're sacrificing in order to generate mana, draw cards, and just go through our deck. Number one is gonna be Expedition Map. Expedition Map is a one mana artifact. For a two colorless mana, you could tap it and sacrifice it, search your library for a land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. If you have two Tron lands and an Expedition Map in your starting hand, you will have turn three Tron. On turn one, you play your Urza's Tower, play your Expedition Map. On turn two, you play your Urza's Power Plant. You tap your tower and your power plant for two mana, sacrifice your Expedition Map, go grab your Urza's Mine, and then on turn three, you can play your Urza's Mine and you have seven mana. So next up, we have four copies of Chromatic Sphere and four copies of Chromatic Star. The first effect of these cards are exactly the same, which is you pay one colorless mana, tap it, you sacrifice it, and then you add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Chromatic Sphere, when you pay the one mana, tap it, and sacrifice it, you also just get to draw a card. Chromatic Star, on the other hand, only draws you card when Chromatic Star enters a graveyard from play. This difference doesn't matter in Popper, but if you're playing Chromatic Star in any other format, it might. If you're playing Chromatic Star in Modern, your opponent could be playing a card like Leyline of the Void, which says if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard, remove it from the game instead. So if you pay the one mana to sacrifice Chromatic Star, it would not be put into the graveyard, it would immediately go into exile. This is why technically speaking, Chromatic Sphere is a better card, but in Popper, they are exactly the same. And the final card in the main deck, we have one copy of Relic of Progenesis, which is a one mana artifact that allows you to tap it to make a target player remove a card from his or her graveyard from the game, or you could pay one mana, remove Relic of Progenesis from the game, remove all graveyards from the game, draw a card. A mainboard Relic of Progenesis will always be really good in pretty much any format you play, because if you have an opponent that's playing a graveyard deck and you play Graveyard Hate, at the beginning of the first game, they pretty much just automatically lose because they won't have answers for it. So it's just a really good card. We're running one copy in the main board, but we are running two copies in the sideboard and we're gonna get into the sideboard now. So first off, we have three copies of Fiery Cannonade, which is a three mana red and two colorless instant that deals two damage to any non-pirate creature. Now I know this is a red card and we don't have red mana in our deck, but we have the Crystal Grottos and we have the Chromatic Stars and Chromatic Spheres to filter our mana to make red mana. If our opponent's going really wide, we can crack a Chromatic Star, create a red mana, and cast Fiery Cannonade to kill their stuff. And in other Tron lists, there's also Energy Refractor, which is kind of like the most popular card for Tron at the moment. It's recently printed and uh, it's seeing a lot of activity right now. Um, that card can also filter you a Fiery Cannonade if you play Energy Refractors in this deck. Next up, we have three copies of Weather the Storm which is a two mana instant, a green and a colorless that says you gain three life and it has storm. Storm means that when you cast a spell, you get to copy the spell for every other spell that was cast this turn. So if your opponent's playing burn or combo and they've casted like three or four cards this turn, you could play Weather the Storm and that will gain you 9-12 life because Weather the Storm will get copied for every card that was cast. Cards with Storm are also impervious to counters because they can counter the main card, but it got copied three, four times. And so unless they have three or four counter spells up, uh, you just get to Storm and gain a bunch of life. Next up, we have four copies of Deglamour, which is a two mana instant, a green or colorless. Uh, choose target artifact or enchantment. Its owner shuffles it into his or her library. Deglamour is a really good card because there are a lot of decks that can bring their artifacts from the graveyard back onto the battlefield. Uh, but this shuffles it into their library, so now it's just gone forever until they draw it again. Next up, we have three copies of Pulse of Marasa, which is a three mana green and a colorless instant 
Return target creature or land card from your graveyard to its owner's hand, you gain 6 life. It shouldn't be a surprise that a Tron deck's biggest weakness are cards that blow up its lands. When you're playing Tron, your opponent can bring in something like Molten Rain, blow up your Urza's Tower, and now you may not see one again for another like 6 turns, and you no longer have the 7 mana needed to play your deck. Well, Samarasa is a great card because it gains you life and you can return your blown up Tron lands back into your hand so you can play them again and stay on your game plan. And then finally in the sideboard, we have two more copies of Relic of Progenesis. We have the one in main board against graveyard decks, but usually one is not enough. If you see somebody on a graveyard plan, having two more is always good uh, just to stop them from what they're doing. So that is going to be Mono Green Tron for Popper. I love Tron. I know I say I love every deck, whatever, shut up. Uh, I love this deck. Um, I'm super excited to play it. I promise at some point we will open up uh, some other Tron decks. We will get Flicker Tron and we'll get Combo Tron. Um, those decks are just kind of hard to explain because there's a lot going on with them. Um, this is a nice introduction to Tron because it's pretty straightforward. You play your Tron lands, play your big guys, call it a day. Um, with that being said, like I mentioned, this deck will be down in description below alongside playlists with other decks that we've opened. We're going to be doing boggles here within the next week or so. Kind of depends when it comes in the mail. Um, it's also the holidays, if you couldn't tell. So, uh, happy holidays to you, whether you're celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, whether it's Christmas is over and it's New Year's, or maybe it's your birthday, whatever it may be. Hope you have a good holiday season. I will see you guys in the next one.